thank you. I love it when the librarian doesn't have to shush. <laughs> uh, welcome to Darien Library. My name is Erin Shea. I'm the head of adult programming here at the library. Thank you so much for coming out today and stepping out in the damp weather. I'm glad that the precipitation that's falling isn't frozen, so I'm personally fine with a little bit of rain as long as it's not snow or ice. I'd just like to briefly mention that programs at the library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your continued support to make events like these possible. I also just wanted to mention that starting tomorrow, we are going to be having a community-wide art project taking place at, you may have noticed, it's hard to miss, the giant table to the left of our welcome desk. We are going to be inviting members of the community to come in and cut out from giant pieces of construction paper. And the influence is actually woven into tonight's talk. It's going to be uh, based on Matisse's cutouts. So we're going to be collecting those pieces. And then we're going to, after two weeks, put them on panels. And eventually, those will be displayed in our lower level art gallery. So you can be a part of it. It's for all ages. It's great to either bring the kids to, bring the parents to. And then we'll have people sign in, and your name will actually be counted as a credit in the art gallery. So it'll be pretty special. Uh, today's speaker is a specialist in late 19th century and early 20th century French art and culture. Formerly an associate educator at the Museum of Modern Art, she continues to give tours and teach online and in-person classes for the museum. She also serves as the coordinator for the Center for Curatorial Leadership's new Mellon-funded seminar in curatorial practice. She's visiting us today from Brooklyn. Please join me in welcoming Miss Larissa Bela. And I'm, I'm mic'd this way because, as you'll notice, I tend to move around, and um, I don't lack for enthusiasm when I talk about artists that I just adore. And Matisse really falls under that category. Um, one of you asked me, you know, do I go around to different places talking about Matisse? Um, no. I mean, I don't have a shtick. I've taught classes on Matisse. Um, he's an artist that. I think since I started studying art history has resonated for me, as I'm sure he's resonated for many of you. And at whatever you point, point you come to him in your life, as a child or older, I think he's somebody that can teach us new lessons. And he's also an artist, I think I'm going to tear up in saying this, but I think he's also an artist that always found new lessons throughout his life, looking at other artists, looking at other cultures. And that's very much a part of what we're going to talk about. Um, an artist who continually found reinvigoration. And um, you know, we will talk about his entire career. We will also focus on the cutouts. But also, I think, um, what I want to point out is the way in which the cutouts were a culmination of a lifelong engagement and curiosity with form, with shape, with flatness. His dance, if you will, and of course, I'm you know, naming um, in that sense of dance, one of his most famous works, but also a motif that was important to him throughout his career. So if in some ways my talk today seems circular, I hope that it is, because I think we're going to come full circle um, as we begin to see Matisse become an artist and tangle with, wrestle with, play with, and I think there's a lot of play in his work, um, motifs that will preoccupy him for his entire life. And in some ways, the cutouts are some of his best work. And they are a way in which he revives his passion and play that we'll see all throughout. So here we start with um, a self-portrait, um, probably done around 1911. Uh, I should say, you know, to sort of frame his life, he's born in 1869. He dies in, in 1954. So he lives to be 84 years old, not quite 85 a very wonderful, rich, long life um, in which he never stops making art, no matter what challenges he faces. He doesn't do a lot of self-portraits, so get a good look. We're not going to see very much of him again. We see him everywhere in his art, but he's not like Picasso, whom we'll talk about, friend and rival, who's always splashing himself, whether in disguise or without, um, on his canvases. Matisse sort of takes a little backstage. He lets his studio space speak for him. He lets his art speak for him. But here, in a rare moment, he allows us into the studio. We see the palette. We see him engaging with the canvas, other artworks behind him. But I always like to start with origins. 
um, and we like to see how far Matisse comes. If this is the way Matisse continued painting for the rest of his life, we wouldn't be here today. I know I wouldn't be here, you know, speaking with you today, right? Um, you know, interesting, fin de siècle, and by that I mean end of the century um, kind of painting here. I wish I had early pictures of Matisse, but I can tell you about his early life, right? He's um, born in the north of France, right near the Belgian border. Uh, his parents own a grain shop. Uh, and he is raised to go into law, right? Isn't that the story of so many artists of the 19th and 20th centuries? Oh, they were supposed to be a banker. Oh, they were supposed to be a lawyer. Those were the two approved professions, and your parents were really happy if you went that way. But for most of the stories of the bohemian artists, they throw off those shackles, so to speak. And forgive me if you're lawyers or bankers, right? It does pay the bills, certainly, and it may give you fulfillment, but not for these artists, right? I mean, I'm talking about Cezanne and others, but Matisse, He's really not cut out to be a lawyer, but that's what he kind of trains to do. And he comes at the late age of 20, right? I always think that's funny when scholars say that, right? He should have probably known he was going to be an artist sooner, but he doesn't. He's laid up with appendicitis, and his parents are already beginning to realize he's not cut out for this career. You know, he's a paralegal, and um, he's not showing any ambition or inclination towards the law. He'd been already making dioramas and little sort of you know, theatrical sets with his friends and, and doing a little art. Um, and he gets appendicitis. He's laid up. His mother gives him a paint box. And he says he opened it up and found paradise. I don't know why I'm so sentimental today, but there's something about Matisse that really touches me, um, that he's so sincere as an artist that he struggled against all odds to do what he wanted to do. And thinking about opening up and finding a bit of paradise, something that will come back to us again and again, whether Matisse is traveling to, to places we might you know, see as a type of paradise, but, but finding that calling and knowing that you'll do anything to be able to, to hold on to that. So he recovers from the appendicitis. He explains to his parents, actually, law is not for me. And they say, great, we don't have any money for you. And um, you know, what are you going to do? He goes off to Paris, and this is where we find him, at the atelier of Gustave Moreau. So this painting serves as an early painted work, a record of this young artist in his 20s, already probably you know, at an advanced stage, should have started it earlier, but finding a master to study with, Gustave Moreau. And you know, we get a little sense of the studio, probably didn't look quite as murky as this. That's just the way it's painted. But a live nude model, plaster casts, um, and a group of artists paying a nominal fee to study under an already established painter. right? Not a very conventional painter, a painter who made a bit of success, Gustave Moreau. You might be familiar with his uh, name. I'm going to show you a few of his works. So um, again, he's uh, Matisse's main teacher. And in looking at these works from the 60s and 70s, and Moreau keeps painting like this in the 80s and 90s, you might think, gee, you know, why did he want to take Matisse under his wing, or what could Matisse get from him? Well, you know, Moreau was established. He could fight the academy a little bit. And he was really supportive of his students. And he let them do whatever they wanted to do. If they wanted to paint a certain way, he let them try it out. And often, he would mostly, I should say, take them to the Louvre and tell them to copy after the great masters. Not so different from other painters of the day or teachers. But he had his own style, and he allowed his pupils their own style. And for this, we should be grateful, because he cultivated Matisse. He allowed Matisse to start to become the Matisse that we know and love, to try out different things, to start with the basics, to really study across art history, but to be himself, and not to be like Moreau. I go back for a second also, because um, I just want to mention another thing about this image. Um, we see a nude figure there. I've already mentioned that, right? This was the way artists learned. If you could associate yourself with a studio or an atelier, you would go and study, and you would you know, draw after the nude model, male or female. And I want to mention, um, again, to kind of dispel some of the myths of Matisse, at least in the beginning. Apparently, when the first female model was there you know, in front of Matisse, um, everybody else finished their drawings, and Henri um, stammered and stuttered and couldn't finish and erased and seemed quite uncomfortable with the female nude. Maybe it was a year or two before this. But apparently, he just had a real trouble with looking at the nude, the female nude, working on the female nude, and capturing that essence. He got over this really quick. So I just 
Let's put that out there, right? Um, so again, just to show you, because this I think gives the backdrop of um, training uh, in the 19th century. And some of you might be quite familiar with this, but what kind of works was Matisse looking at specifically at the Louvre? What do we know that he actually copied after? And these are um, the originals. I mean, they're in reproduction on the screen, but they're not Matisse's copies. But we know that Matisse copied these very works and these artists. So Renaissance works by Raphael, that's the Count of Castiglione, was a favorite of his. Um, Chardin, who did such wonderful Jean Racine's and still life work. Um, so Matisse is, is drinking this in, working with it and against it. And he works in Moreau's studio for several years. And when I say he was bohemian, or I should say poor, right, um, you know, he makes other artist stories look luxurious, right? I mean, living on potatoes, doing whatever he had to do to be an artist, to study with Moreau, to work with other painters, including people like Georges Rouault, who is probably the most famous painter outside of Matisse that comes out of Moreau's studio. So here's a work that Matisse does called Reading in 1896, right? We're getting there. We're getting to something that approximates modern art. And even this would have been considered pretty modern for the time. But if you, you know, looked across the spectrum of, of painters in the 1890s in France, this is not that out there. But you know, this interesting work, a domestic interior, a woman in a corner, Matisse loves corners, um, you know, reading, Jean Racine, but with little touches here or there that, that maybe we can see Matisse sort of coming out. This was well accepted, and Matisse could have had an academic career coming out of Moreau's studio or working in Moreau's studio. People liked this. He was asked to show at the Salon which is where you know, the official venue, the exhibition space held annually, where you sold paintings from. But he chose not to. He decided that this was too academic, too staid, too boring. And you know, it took all of his courage to know that he was not going to sell if he tried something new. He was making sales, and his family started to say, OK, maybe you can do something with this. And he decided no. Um, I'm throwing this in. This is another favorite artist, and then I'll show you where Matisse goes with this. But La Desserte, and forgive me, I've forgotten all of my French accents in these, so you'll just have to um, pretend that they're there. But La Desserte, the, the dessert, or, or a, a still life that's um, overflowing. It's a kind of type of still life where everything is luxurious and overflowing, and you know, it might be about dessert, but it also might just be about this kind of abundant meal. Um, and it's amazing. It doesn't get justice done to it in um, PowerPoint there. But um, you know, this captivated Matisse for his entire life. And he made copy after copy, and then his own takes on this. So I just throw that out there. Um, and he begins to move in this direction. So we saw from that sort of dark interior, the figure sort of introspectively turned against the wall, to something like this. Now, some of you might be saying, well, that seems like the light touch of the Impressionists from a few years before, right? Um, the lighter touch, the sketchy touch, the light-filled space. Well, you know, the salon judges weren't very interested in this. They felt this was pushing something too far. Look at the sort of strange angle of the table, the way in which we're brought into the space, a kind of ambiguity of the space. The, the, scumbling work, the sort of rough quality to this, too much light. And instead of backing down, Matisse said, I'm going to keep pursuing and looking to modern masters, and I'm going to innovate what I do. So I just sort of throw this in, because again, he's sort of thinking about Dahim and that dessert, and then rewriting it, and he'll continue to do that until he gets to something like this. And I'm jumping around in years here. We'll go back again in a minute. But this is one of the culminations, one of the um, sort of ways in which he pushes that Dahin. Um, and I know this because he talks about it. It's not just because I've looked at these, because you might say, well, how do you get that from there? And you get this female figure. Well, I know that for you know, this image here, sorry, starting with Dahim, um, that he puts his girlfriend at the time, um, Caroline Chablot, um, into the image. They're living together. They're absolutely poor. They're spending all their money on fruit and flowers to be able to kind of keep staging this table. Um, and you know, he wants it to be a masterpiece, a modern masterpiece, but it's not. Um, but you know, even after 
well, the fruit is gone and the relationship dies. Um, he'll marry someone else. But he's rethinking that. So think about this as a restaging of Caroline in this new, more modern image 10 years later. This is one that we have to go to Russia to see. It ended up in um, purchased by Sergei Shukin. And as I always say, thank goodness for the Russians, they kept Matisse alive when the French weren't ready to buy his work. Um, that's why so much of it ended up um, you know, in the Hermitage, but in the, the hands of Shukin, Morsov, and others during this first decade. The French get, you know, they get wind of, <laughs> of this, and they, they come around. Um, but look at this gorgeous harmony in red, right? And we're going to kind of keep thinking about those cutouts or thinking about forms that kind of exist on their own and weave in and out of his pictures. They take on an animation in a certain way. And I think we see that here. We see a lot of other things, too. Flattening out of space, bright fields of color, ambiguity, right? Don't we love that word? Certainly at MoMA, we love the word ambiguity. Ambiguity and modern are pretty you know, interchangeable. What do I mean about ambiguity? Well, what exactly is happening in this interior? So a woman standing at the table. But you might notice the way in which the tablecloth and the wallpaper sort of coalesce. And then is that a painting on the wall? Or do you read it as a window looking out into the landscape? Matisse loves pushing this ambiguity and the slippage between things. He's not trying to fool us. He's not a trickster. But it's a way of conceiving of the experience in a different way. And you know what? It doesn't really matter if it's a painting or a landscape outside. And you can argue, and scholars have, this way and that. What matters more is that it generates you know, an interesting experience and meaning for us, that it can be both, that it's not so fixed and monumental. That's what painting had been for so long. I have a background. I have a foreground. Let's experience the figure in relation to space. He collapses that. He makes it interesting. And he does that in works like this. And color allows him to do that, to bring together the, the foreground and the background. What if I told you, and some of you might know, that this painting, in fact, was painted light blue? Right? It, and then the navy was, you know, he was looking at fabric. And so he took that sort of style of the fabric, the decoration, and then he decided, you know what? I need to make it red. So he painted the red over the blue. And it changed things completely. He had to change the title. Couldn't be Harmony in Blue anymore. It could be Harmony in Red. And I, you know, I, I joke about that, but it, it did change everything. Um, he did the same in making the Red Studio at MoMA. It was light blue underneath. And think about you know, how that shifts the way we feel about things. He knew that color impacted us. Um, you know, perhaps differently, but it impacts us. Um, I just want to bring up some other people who are on Matisse's mind. And um, you can't deny that Cezanne is, you know, one of the, the father figures. He's contemporary with Matisse for a while. Um, and, you know, Cezanne is an artist artist. And by that I mean, you know, it's Gauguin, it's Degas, it's Matisse who recognized what Cezanne is doing before other people will buy him. When Cezanne dies in 1906 and has a giant retrospective, then people can claim him as, a, as sort of, you know, suddenly we discover this artist. But he'd been doing things all along. And Matisse even buys um, a work by Cezanne in 1899. I mentioned that Matisse married. He married a woman named Amélie, who swore she would never marry an artist or a redhead, and she did both, um, sometimes to her chagrin. Uh, but when they got married and they had very little money, Matisse ran out and spent it on a couple of paintings, including one by Cezanne. Um, that's kind of how their marriage worked. But he felt that there were artists who could teach him things. And Cezanne always remained a touchstone. So you know, here we have um, Matisse's work, and we have Cezanne. And Cezanne taught him um, all kinds of things, but how to construct a surface. Um, how to give a sense of multiple perspective. And you know, even when I look at that Cezanne there, I mean, again, I'm going to throw out some questions. And you, you can sort of think about this, or you could even jump out with an answer. But which one looks more modern? And I'm not sure. The Cezanne, the Matisse? I mean, 
The Cezanne looks like a Matisse. And, and, you know, and I did that intentionally. And I, we could pick other works. But you know, um, definitely from about 1899, 1900 to about 1905, Matisse goes back and forth when he's making sculpture, he's making paintings. He's thinking about Cezanne. So. And that's the one he owns, um, the one that Matisse owns. And he refused to get rid of, even when he had no money. And eventually, in the 1920s, he dedicated it, gave, gave it to the French state. But you know, keep your eye on those bodies, the sense of androgyny, the sense of kind of almost a flattened out form, um, the construction of the, the brushworks. That was near and dear to Matisse's heart. Um, Paul Signac captivates Matisse. He goes to study with him. And guess what? You know, 1904, um, Signac is a kind of elder statesman. He even buys some of Matisse's paintings for a little while to keep him afloat, pun intended. Um, and you know, uh, this is one of the things that comes out of it. Looks comme mes volupté. Um, Matisse loves travel. He loves the heat of the sun, and he loves the Mediterranean light. This is kind of a, a refrain throughout his life. Um, so he packs up Amélie. Um, they go down to Saint-Tropez. They um, experience the beautiful Mediterranean light. Amélie poses again and again and again. That's actually Amélie, right? Um, and then sort of reincorporated in this pastoral scene with the flying baguettes. They're not really flying baguettes. I just wanted to see if you were listening. Um, <laughs> but you know, somehow capturing this sort of way of the light um, in, these, in these almost pointless dots, right? And although I've sh just flashed Signac at you quickly, you might also recognize that Signac comes out of the tradition of Seurat with pointless dots bright colors, et cetera. And Matisse likes that, but he's not going to stay there, right? His methodical dots just get more varied and more varied. Um, and he's going to move out of that very quickly. I'm letting Duran's portrait here um, speak to a relationship that develops around 1905, a friendship between the much younger Andre Duran, he's about 12 years younger than Matisse, and Matisse. And um, they both go to Couloir another place in the south of France, and they shore each other up because it's not easy to be an artist when you're not selling and your wife, I'm not, not berating Amélie, but you know, she's asking, where are we going to get the money? Right? We've got two sons. We've got a daughter from your previous relationship. You're not selling very much here. Uh, you got that stays on on the wall, but nothing's happening. Um, and you know, so Duran and Matisse, they feel they're on the cusp of something. As Duran says, we use color like sticks of dynamite. So maybe he's a little more feisty than Matisse. But the truth is Matisse needs somebody to help him at this, this moment to be brave. And you can see Duran here um, painting in what we'll start to call a fauve style. So around 1905, um, the, the strokes get broader. They're just as wild and exuberant. They're emotive. They're non-naturalistic, right? I mean, did Matisse, I mean, yes, his beard was red, but it, you know, it didn't look like that. So these broad strokes, this colorful touch, this exuberance, um, that's what Duran and Matisse are doing. And they come back from Couloir, they show their work at the Salon de Tom, or the, the Autumn Salon, and everybody says, wow, you know, you're fauve, right? You're wild beasts, or you, it looks like it's painted by wild beasts. This is so beyond. And it is so beyond, right? There's Couloir, there's Matisse painting at that time. He's collapsing space, right? He's using just touches of color. He's leaving open canvas. And it's incredibly audacious. What was even more audacious, and what I think people were kind of you know, running, screaming from the galleries, if you thought all that was done after Impressionism, right? When they called the Impressionists in the 1870s you know, crazy or you know, like cat scratches and, you know, um, they just said it was painted by madmen. Uh, they did it again when Matisse and his friends showed. They said, why does Madame Matisse have a green stripe down her face? Or why does she have all these blotches of color? Or how can you break apart color like that? How can you not make it more polished? And people really did argue and scream and fight over art in 1905. But Matisse will, will move on and start to broaden those swatches of color. Right, um, and you know the the touch will will become these these bands and this flattening out, and he will explore um, 
you know, bodies in this way, almost cut out shapes. And again, that's, that's going to kind of become his leitmotif. Um, there's lots we could say about this work. It's Arcadian. It, it seems to suggest sort of primal origins. Um, there's an eroticism and a lyricism. Can we put our finger on, on when this is? It's some kind of Arcadian past, right? And these strange figures, they're becoming distorted, right? So for those who didn't like a green stripe down Amelie's face, what do you think they thought of this? Signac even said that Matisse had gone crazy. Look at the way also in which the, the figures seem kind of flat and put onto the space, right? They're not in relation to space per se or each other. And also keep your eye on the dancers in the back because Matisse will take them out from this work. Serge Chouquin saw this work and his son and they said, oh, that's nice. And Matisse will scoop those dancers out and bring them to the front of the composition in his famous dance. Um, I just bring in um, Leo and Gertrude Stein, and here is Gertrude and her partner, um, Alice B. Toklas, um, there, uh, feeding the pigeons. But this is before that Gertrude and Leo had been living together and, of course, um, supporting artists. Um, we see a Matisse right there, in fact now at SFMOMA, but originally in their collection. We also see Picasso's work. We see Picasso's portrait of Gertrude Stein. And um, Picasso is, uh, has moved to Paris full time. He's looking around. And he knows that Matisse is the head of the succès de scandale. Doesn't sound so great in French. But you know, uh, a scandalous success. No, that doesn't pay your bills. I keep you know, reiterating this. Matisse is broke, but everybody thinks he's the most avant-garde. So when young Picasso comes, um, you know, from Barcelona and settles in Paris. He looks around and he wants to make his mark by one-upping Matisse. And he will do it in some ways. Um, it's Gertrude who, and we were just talking about Midnight in Paris. This is a little earlier than, than when the movie is set, Midnight in Paris. She'll continue to introduce people and to hold salons. First she and um, Leo will, will separate. When they do, um, Leo gets the Matisses, Gertrude gets the Picassos, but um, you know that's the way it is. Um, but right now she's introducing artists, and in fact she introduces Matisse and Picasso, and there they are. Look at them, right? Um, asserting themselves, saying that you know they are the head of the modern school. Both of them very much looking to Cezanne again, who passes in this year and who has this enormous retrospective, and you know Picasso is is saying, I'm ready. I'm ready for anything you can lay down. Isn't it interesting that Matisse is kind of wearing a sailor shirt, which is often what we associate with Picasso. So that could be a whole other lecture. But I kind of leave this notion, and I'll point out just a couple more things, that they get to know each other. At this point, they're rivals. They do not like each other. There's a Matisse camp, a Picasso camp. They're both looking at each other's art. Um, Matisse is pushing further and further. Uh, on his first trip to North Africa, he comes back. He paints this. And he's thinking through sculpture and painting, um, but creates this wonderful and, and terrifying, certainly to audiences at the time, um, blue nude. And that's at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And I mentioned the Cohen collection because it was the wonderful Cohen sisters, um, very foresightful, friends of the Stein, who started buying um, work by Matisse. And that's why there's so much in Baltimore. Um, why is she blue? Because Picasso loves color. Ostensibly, he says, it's because he's looking at um, the Twarg people, and uh, a lot of them do dye fabrics. So he says their skin was actually tinged a little bit blue. But that's also a great excuse to make really modern art that's going to baffle people and to um, excite them and enrage them. So there she is. And guess who it excited and enraged? Well, a lot of people. Um, this was burned in effigy as a poster in Chicago in 1913. Um, because people thought, you know, it, it was too out there. But it incited Picasso um, to create Demoiselle Damignon, who was already working on it. But, it, you know, if Matisse does Blue Nude, well, I have to, you know, really, put, yeah, pump up my game. And, of course, both of them are looking at, and will continue to look at, and it's probably Matisse who introduced Picasso to African sculpture and masks here, but just you know, two examples. There's certainly a range um, of wonderful African sculpture in, in France at this time, and neither artist or, or really any of the artists give credit to the different you know, groups and all of that, but they do feel liberated 
um, by the different things that they're seeing. And you can see, of course, that Picasso um, you know, is pulling at the last minute. He sort of puts the masks on their African oceanic masks that he's collected um, that he is uh, looking at at the ethnographic museums. And just to show that Matisse is looking at that for his sculpture. Um, I throw this in too, though, um, because I want to be you know, really clear about Matisse's sources. He is looking at, and I'll show you, Persian miniatures. He is looking at African statuary. He is looking at, on a trip to Italy, he sees and goes to. Has anybody been to the Arena Chapel in Padua? Yeah? Gorgeous blue. Can't do justice to it like this, right? So Matisse was swept away by the blue, which then becomes the blue that he tries to recreate in his paintings. So he's reaching back to you know, proto-Renaissance painting as well. He will mix and mingle. Right? And he'll say, I give credit to Giotto. I, you know, it's this mystical blue. Um, but he's going to synthesize and combine all these things. Right? But let's linger with this work for a minute. Let's dance with it. Right? Um, here, I think, we get the beginnings of the cutout. Right? It's not cut out. It's painted oil on canvas. Um, he's doing this as a step to do one more painting for Shukin which ends up having red figures. But it's based on this. And he doesn't consider it a study. He actually considers it you know, his, its own painting um, as he's thinking through his ideas. But look at those dancers. The Parisians thought this was just as bad as Demoiselle d'Avignon, just as offensive. And why? Because it's ambiguous, gender ambiguous even, or at least not what people were expecting in terms of conventions right, of the human body. I mean, there are breasts. But you know, the bodies are distended, distorted, flattened out. He only uses a couple of colors. Those are those male figures, the, the sailors in the back of the bonheur de vivre, or the happiness of life, but made into this huge composition, pushed forward. It is both flattened, and yet we get a sense of movement. And, you know, Matisse is really one of the only ones pushing this, or the only one pushing this. One of the things that I find most exciting about all of Matisse's work, um, especially from this point forward, is that he engages with this idea of evolution, change, process. Now, maybe he gets some of this from Cezanne. But what I mean by that, and, and is a little hard to see in this PowerPoint, but um, is the way in which the bodies seem to grow and morph and change. What is dance, if you're going to show movement, but a kind of dynamism that continues? Right? Look at this section here, which he's got to be looking at the Sistine ceiling and that notion of, of God you know, um, giving life to Adam. Right? There's, in art history, there's no much more, there's no, no other place that has quite that electricity and that energy, I think. Um, it, you know, the Sistine Chapel, that is. I mean, this, this, I think, tries to go for that. This notion of we know that touch, we know that potential, and what it's going to do that Michelangelo captures in that. Here, Matisse is playing with that. Maybe, maybe she'll slip this way, right? Maybe this figure will, you know, will be moving that way. But we also have that notion that our eye reads it you know, as if they will connect. And so we connect things. We become part of the dance. We experience a kind of duration. And I think Matisse likes this as a notion of expressing his own process. He doesn't want to say that art is finished, it's polished, it's perfectly composed, the figures should be in the center, and it should be perfected. He doesn't give us perfectly modeled figures. And he gives us, in fact, figures that seem to be either coming into being or maybe even falling apart here. He's also studied dancers. So as, as strange as this might look, he's actually made sculptures for this foot here to try out you know, different positions. Look at those dark lines. Right? He's asserting that these are not perfectly, you know, illusionistically contoured figures. He's getting away from that academic tradition. And what he gets in exchange is a freedom, a dynamism, a sense of expression, and a sense of coming into being. And I think that he likes repeating that in his works through growing plants, through penimenti, through showing us drawing and not erasing it. Right? Going back and, and rewriting his lines, letting us see his pencil, letting us see his paint. But he also here is saying that a body or a form, something in flight or in dance, can be flat, flattened out. 
and then that's a positive rather than a negative for art making. And I'm just going to flash through some of his sources here. Um, very, very exciting time for him is going to Morocco. It rains for a month, and he writes to Gertrude Stein and says, you know, get me out of here. What am I going to do? I've spent all my money. I'm holed up in a hotel. But fortunately, the light clears. And he says everything is suffused with you know, this gorgeous pink light. Sorry, the rain clears. And um, there he is, sketching, absorbing. Whether he goes to places or not, he goes to exhibitions. So that's where he sees Persian miniatures, actually in Berlin. He travels to Italy. But in Morocco, it's the gardens that really captivate him, the costumes, the sights, the sounds, the smells, everything about it. This is one of the paintings that he does um, that comes out of that. And again, that kind of exuberant color that goes beyond nature but gives us somehow a sense of experience, right? And I'm looking at you because you told me that, that well, about a wonderful experience, but we'll start with the first part. So tell me about Morocco. The Kasba. Yeah, it's so, so, you know, it's a, it's a place where one can be transfixed and inspired, especially if one loves color, even, even simple color, but color contrast and, and um, you know, all of the senses seem to come together. And one scholar said after Matisse came back, so he spends time there in 1912, 1913, after he came back, his figures were always more botanized. They were turned into plants, and you know his his plants became more people-like, and that's in sculpture and painting. Um, but I think it's an interesting uh, take, and we can see that here. Um, so the bazaars. This is a work. He's no longer in Morocco. He's stuck in World War One. He has to be in France. He wants to fight, but he can't. He goes back to his sketchbooks, and he spent about seven months in in Tangiers, um, off and on. But you know he's evoking in very cubist form, right? Multiple perspective, very flattened forms. Um, some of the experience. Now we have digital cameras, and we can just go back onto our computer and all of that. But he's really trying to relive um, the experiences in Morocco here. This is one of my favorite works at MoMA. Um, so some of the things that you experienced, and maybe some others of you who've been there or seen um, similar things on your travels. So the beautiful architecture and terrace, um, a figure actually at a cafe. And you know, again, you're getting multiple perspectives. So if, you're, if it's hard to read, there is slippage. There is ambiguity. But look at that pink that sort of connects these different zones, maybe that beautiful pink light that washed across things, maybe the pink architecture. Um, and these, which look like Moroccans, and they also look cut out shapes, um, they're actually melons. There are melons on the hot pavement that you might see off the terrace. I know that from his sketchbooks. I don't know that from looking at it, because here's some of that wonderful slippage. And he's not saying anything about Moroccans or people at prayer. He's just collapsing our experience so that his vegetation looks more like people or the other way around. He'll do that to women. He'll do that you know, in lots of pictures. So it's not just Moroccans. But here, I think, is this wonderful conflation where most of us might think that you know, these are figures on a, on a prayer rug. But imagine. Again, the sounds, the call to prayer, and all of that. Um, I think I'm going to speed us up and take him to Nice. In 1917, he moves to the south of France. Um, again, this is a man who loved the heat of the sun. I should say about Morocco that um, this black field is both, it's a lot of things. It's very modern. It, it you know, is a field against which these other vignettes are placed. Um, but for him, he says black is something he gets out of Japanese art, but also the heat of the sun. So imagine a guy who's always in pursuit of the heat of the sun, you know, couldn't wait to get out of, you know, forgive me, but the cold, rainy place where he was from. Um, and then eventually will settle in Nice, where, again, he finds the captivating light. It's very theatrical there, and he sort of plays that up in his images. Some people say that he's retreating from some of the um, sort of radicalism of what he's done before, but he always makes it Matissean and plays with color. Um, and there he is sort of setting up his, his favorite textiles and screens, one of his models there, a ballerina, um, but dressing her up as an odalisque, a uh, sort of reclining figure. He's thinking about Delacroix. But again, he's going to push the boundaries, the flattened 
experiences, the patterns that seem to sort of take over. It's not just about the costumes or, again, a kind of modern theatricality. Um, he's thinking about Michelangelo, and he really did look at Michelangelo's sculpture, male figures. There's a lot of gender bending going on, where he just sort of slips between the forms. Um, this wonderful woman with the veil there. But what's going on in the background? The strange blues and pinks and the armchair that just kind of morphs the shapes of the, of the diamonds of her um, outfit that seem to sort of take over. And here, the girl with the tambourine. Um, that's the tambourine over there. Couldn't make it out. Oh, sorry. Um, in the corner there. But it's also just shapes, right? The way in which the chair sort of bends. I wish my chair like perfectly fit me, right? Um, I guess you can order those on TV. But, um, but you know, I don't, I don't know any fatais or armchairs at that point that did that, or how it kind of loses it, its leg and it you know, becomes a substitute there. I should say, you might not know or you might, that Matisse loved music. That's why he creates the piano, piano lesson. He played violin. At one point, he thought maybe he would give up art making and play the violin. Um, he didn't. But he did practice for hours every day. And so when we see references to music, it is also autobiographical. Um, he goes to Tahiti in 1930. And most people don't talk too much about this, um, because he doesn't produce a lot of art in that point. He's finally getting some renown. Picasso is much more famous. Um, and Matisse is getting some, some accolades. Um, and he travels around a little bit, comes to the United States, goes to Tahiti. Um, this is a rare sculpture that he comes up with, tiare. And, and it's, tiare is the flower. Gauguin puts a lot of um, tiare flowers uh, in his sculptures or paintings. So he's kind of, he, I mean, he loves Tahiti. He does a lot of swimming um, and uh, takes a lot of photographs. But it takes a while to kind of you know, stay with him. Um, just showing other types of sculpture here. And again, that notion of the body changing, morphing. He starts with a live model very early on. In fact, this is um, back five. Back, back one was started um, from a live model uh, 25 years before this. So he's still sort of thinking through the architectonics of the body, thinking through Cezanne, thinking about um, relief sculpture. And this is, of course, one of many. We have them all lined up at, on uh, Loma Sculpture Garden. It's wonderful to see them and to touch them. Sometimes we let people put on gloves and touch them. Um, and of course, mentioning the barns again. Um, you see repeated here that dance motif, right? There is something about movement, about the dynamism that you know, Barnes wanted and wanted Matisse to recreate based on the original dance works. Um, and we can see that, that that sense of a sort of cutout or a flattening is coming to the fore. By the way, Matisse got the dimensions wrong and had to completely redo this. So um, that's what he redid, and you can see his works underneath. This is um, just to mention that Matisse goes through a little kind of lag in the 1930s, and that rivalry he had developed with Picasso turns into a friendship, and they begin to feed off of each other more at this point. And so, in fact, it looks, not just from my slide, but as if, in some ways, Matisse is kind of rethinking his own practice through what Picasso's doing. And then Picasso kind of takes what Matisse has been doing in terms of color. When you look at Girl Before the Mirror and Picasso's work in MoMA's collection, that background might strike you as very Matissean from his Odalisque, from his reclining figures that he's doing in Nice from 1917 on. And you'd be right. So there's an interchange, even when Picasso was sort of pushing the surrealist mode. Um, but moving us to the cutouts, or, or um, what we would call a cutout form, he begins playing with um, these flatter shapes these more stylized and simplified forms um, in the 1940s. Now, why? Well, he's getting older. Um, he's had cancer. He's had an operation. He's often bedridden. But he wants to keep up his practice. And a lot of publishers are having him do illustrations for books. That's how jazz um, comes to be. They ask him to write a book. And so this, this famous work, Icarus, um, was a print that came out of a cutout you know, essentially collage that he created. So he cut the forms, put them together, and then that was printed as part of his book on jazz. And um, jazz wasn't the first name. It was actually circus. But if we do think about jazz, and that's what ended up being the title, and um, 
kind of the dynamism of the book itself. Um, really innovative for the time, about movement, about a sort of dynamic energy that the figures carry. And um, I'll show you a few more things, but, but if I can you know, suggest things that you carry with you for those who want to think more about Matisse's cutouts or you know, join this wonderful um, you know, community art project, as you think about the cutouts, think about that liberation, think about the freedom, think about gesture and what he's able to convey through the, the simplicity of that. Think about, of course, you know, this is Icarus, and he's thinking about you know, getting too close to the sun. And you know, we have a sort of cosmology there, but we also have this, this very simplified energy created by the simple forms, the cuts, um, which he's creating at this time. And here um, is the swimmer. I love that kind of almost, is it human, is it animal? Very playful. Right? Maybe a sea lion. Um, he loves swimming, right? And, uh, and then the dynamic forms around it. Who would have thought? And maybe in what you create, you know? The sense of play, the sense of composition. He didn't ever have a favorite color. He liked composing, you know, and finding the relationships and the shapes as he, as he worked, painting or in cutout. Look at how much he's able to give us and how voluptuous that figure is, male or female, and again, it doesn't really matter, um, out of a cutout and what he does give. Here he is with his doves. I bring this up, also just this notion of soaring and flight. I think for Matisse all throughout, but especially the cutouts, and I think this is something that coalesces um, closer to the end of his life, the idea that his process was about unfurling, sweeping, ascending, swimming, and soaring. And you know, the fact that he had favorite pets, but he also is thinking about the water and birds, reminds us of the dynamism that can go either way. Here I am with my two hands. But, you know, swimming, um, diving is like soaring. There's a freedom or being an acrobat, that kind of um, sense that he gives us. This is a gorgeous, and, and um, you can see the ambition and the scale of the sizes of these that begin to grow, but the birds, the algae, the, the forms. Is it underwater? Is it above water? Um, he doesn't need to tell us. And the, the placement of the colors is engaging, dynamic. I just throw this out because it's as if Tahiti comes back to him. He doesn't do anything immediately in 1930, but in the 40s and into the 50s, these shapes, these forms, especially that he's seen in Tahitian quilts, come to him and inspire him. So I hope that you think about that, too, um, if you get a chance to, to use those scissors and carve in color, which is what he said he was doing with the cutouts, carving in color, right? I just throw up a couple more really vibrant images. These are paintings. But again, I think we see the shapes kind of moving and um, you know, there's a, a dynamism to the process. Look at the energy of this. You know, this is a guy who's in a bit of pain. And, um, you know, he's not able to do, have the range of either motion or, uh, or the life that he once had. But he doesn't lose that vigor. He doesn't lose that passion for color or juxtaposition or ambiguity or play. And we see that red come back. We see in, um, you know, this room here. And remember, red is the heat of the sun. Look at the, the play of the patterns, the foliage, all of that in these works, the energy of what he's doing. Um, and we can see him, you know, even at times when he's bedridden, um, drawing on the wall, directing his assistants, cutting things out, being photographed um, by his assistants, um, the shapes, the forms, right? They dance. And I'm going to um, just show us one image from Vance here. But many of you know, some of you may have visited. Um, but here we get the interplay of light right? through these cutout forms. He designs windows, um, costumes, uh, that is the vestries, the um, paintings for the walls. Um, and this through a friendship he develops with a nun who asks him to come and, and you know, create this space. But an even more dynamic sense, and yet essentially from a cutout form, a flattened out you know, interplay of colors. Um, 
And of course, I'm, I'm over time, but I do want to sort of uh, throw this one up and one more picture. Um, here we even have a kind of a mermaid, a dancing figure. Um, and I want you to revel in his color, in the exuberance, um, in the way in which that mermaid is in her environment, in these, these large, very simplified forms that seem to keep repeating for um, the period of the, the 1940s until his death in, in 1954. They, they dance, they swim, they change. And again, talk about carving with color. Think about, you know, is this the antithesis or, or you know, a marriage of what he's doing in the original dance? And then I throw this up, um, because this will definitely be a part of the cutout show that Momo will be having um, starting October 25th. And um, again, I hope that some of the art making that you do and some of the things that we've talked about today sort of um, you know, get you excited about, about seeing a whole bunch of works from um, the last part of um, Matisse's life and career. But again, he wasn't done. This is done two years before he passes. It's incredibly huge. That's 73 feet, by the way. I don't want you to, to um, mistake that. That's 73 by 53 feet. It was in nine panels. It was meant to be set up as a kind of frieze about five feet high, you know, up high, around his dining room. This is what he wanted to have around him. He said, I love swimming. And again, I think that, that freedom, the sense of soaring here in these forms, right? He cuts something out. He plays with it. He doesn't have to see the human figure or a plant in it. It's how he puts it together. It's, it's how it comes into being. And it's filled with life and movement, things we recognize, starfish and you know, other things, figures. Um, but it's ongoing. And to envelop himself and people coming into his space, I think, is very much what his art intends to do. I was thinking about this in relation to um, Monet and how we look at um, Monet's giant water lilies and how he wanted us to be enveloped. And for those of you who've been to the Musée de l'Orangerie and walked into the rooms, and you know, those were done in 1926, finished in 1926. But it's interesting to think about Matisse you know, creating a kind of whole environment um, there, where we would be surrounded by flatness and yet feel more engaged, I think, in both the space and the figures. Um, anyway, so I, I leave it at that. I'm happy to um, answer questions. <laughs> or also to, to hear your comments. Um, it's about engagement and, and experience, and I'm sure that, that many of you have, have had experiences with Matisse. Museums. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So, so um, she's asking about the Paley collection. And a number of the things that I showed are part of the Paley collection. And I'm not a curator. They haven't told us, although I know a number of the Gauguins are out as well, um, which is um, why I've had Paley on my mind. Um, will they come back on permanent display? That's up to the curators. Um, the whole Paley collection is, I don't think, ever up on, on permanent display. So we try to change things out. Um, but it's some of our key pieces. So it, it definitely. Um, well, I have one. Yeah. Are you still protocoling in your practice? Yes. About, you know, no, I don't actually. I know. So um, I will speak to that. And I'll speak freely. And MoMA doesn't, doesn't censor me. Um, yeah. So um, I mean, I will tell you my opinion. And yes, I, I, I do know that Jerry Saltz, I wasn't sure which, you know, he writes a lot. And I read his stuff. And he's amazing. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about the expansion. And um, I hope I don't get fired for this. But I, like I said, I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I am a 19th and early 20th century scholar and educator. And that's what I teach classes on. That's what I love. Um, we have up something like, and don't quote me on this, but it's something like 8% of our collection up at all times. The Whitney has like 
a half a percent. So it's typical for, it's tip, and they're gonna have like one and a half once they get their new building. So I'm not trying to single them out. I'm just saying it's very typical of museums not to have all of their, they can't. They can't have all their permanent collection out. Um, we like to put our superstars up. With that said, we have to, you know, change certain things out for sort of, Sometimes if somebody gives us something, it has to come up, and that can be a good thing. We also like to tell different stories, and I'm, I'm sure our curators, and I'm sure Ann Umland would say the same thing, I know she spoke to you, um, that we like to tell different stories and have different stories available. That's why the new MoMA in 2004 was set up in a way that you could you know, go from kind of color and expressionism to, you know, or you could go cubism, or you could go in this direction, you could go in that, so that um, there are different trajectories of modernism and so many different stories and formal rhymings and beautiful things like that um, that can be told if you show more things, even masterpieces. Um, I will get to, to answering this, but, um, uh, but it is to say, and I think what Ann Temkin did in terms of our abstract expressionist show where she put tons from the permanent collection, just cleared out the fourth floor, put some pop over here because that's what every tourist has to see, and it's good stuff. But she said, I'm clearing it out and I'm putting out more abstract expressionism from our collection than you've ever seen before because there are more stories and dialogues. And you know, was pearl paint on sale yellow that week? Is that why everybody, you know, things that you'd never even think about that, that you could find. And that was brilliant and beautiful, and I think we intend to do more of that. I will now get to answering. I am not a performance person. I could care less about performance in our museum. I'm sorry, I'm gonna get, you know. Um, I think there are some great things about it. It's definitely a direction our museum wants to go. It hurts me every time I read that we are opening up performance spaces and glass things and this and that um, because I would love to have more of our classics on display or ones that we don't get to see. Th they said, okay, we're gonna have more of this and that. They say futurism, but uh, that's not my favorite stuff. But, but you know, like can't we put out more of the Paley collection? Can't we put out more? So it's a constant negotiation, and it's really up to a lot of people, you know, from our director through the curators through um, whomever. Performance is a big initiative. It will take up a chunk of space, but I think that there is some pushback um, in terms of allocating that space given where we're getting it. I'm going to go like this to you. Um, and say, uh, meaning that we pushed out to, to utilize that space. Um, so. Uh, you know, I think there will be negotiations. I think you will definitely see more of our permanent collection, and that's part of the point of it. But I think, you know, MoMA itself um, is very interested in performance and contemporary art, and so that too will have its big spot. Yeah. Well, yes, absolutely. And you know, Matisse and others throughout the 20th century say, I want to be more childlike. And so in some ways, you can say um, to them, and I say to my own kids, um, that, and first of all, you don't have to do the whole rigmarole, right? You don't have to do the whole trajectory. Um, you can either do you know, the dance and a cutout, or you can just start with a cutout and say, this is an artist who tried many different things, but um, in the end, for a big period of his life, the most exciting things that he did were to go back to something more simple. You can even quote artists. Monet said, you know, I want to be blonde, or I want to go back to you know, having the eye of a child. Picasso said the same thing, and, and Picasso even worked with children at different times in his life and career um, to try to get back to what he would call an authenticity or a power. So you can tell kids of any age um, that they have the best sensibility, that they haven't lost yet, that they, they haven't lost their, um, you don't have to say innocence, they haven't lost their power, because they have the best ideas. Now, not all of them want to make flat cutout shapes, but a lot do. So, you know, asking them to try it out and see if they want to make something that's inspired um, by, you know, any of these sort of, like Icarus, I think is a good one. Especially because it, you know, you can either or not um, talk about Greek mythology and talk about who he is. So how would you show flying? How would you show um, getting too close to the sun? Or do you have a different other um, mythical person? Uh, which for my son and my daughter, um, they love myth of any kind. And it, you, know, you can tie it to 
books, TV, whatever, but um, they all have their heroes and their, and their myths. So how, do you, how would they represent that simply through a cutout? Um, or just how do you react to it, asking them first to respond? Do you like this? And, and what do you think is good about it? How would you do it? Kind of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a, the, the best point. You've made a better point than I have. Um, I also love a book called Mutis Picasso, so depending on the age of the kids. Um, but uh, my kids have always loved Matisse and Picasso, and I've not forced the museum on them. And, I, and kids do make the best art. I was just saying I left my kids at home. My son is a draftsman at 10, and uh, my daughter is a multimedia. If it doesn't stick out and have collage and ha you know, use very strange materials, um, it's not art. And that's fine. They're completely different. And whatever they want to make is great. And I hope that, that that's the same for all of your kids, nieces, nephews, grandchildren, and all of that. Um, whatever you make, what is perfect? What, what is perfect, anyway? Anybody else? Um, <laughs> so I don't know. I, again, I'm not one of the um, performance. Oh, the, the question was, um, so we're talking about performance art, and, and um, we're concerned about the utilization of the new space um, and how that's going to be allocated and um, what kind of performance art. Um, she was at the Tate recently and, and a few years ago. Unfortunately, I'm sure that uh, performance has been repeated. No, and again, I don't, I don't want to gut, I don't want to gut performance art because um, I think there is value and expression and um, often sincerity. But uh, you know, MoMA, MoMA feels it has. Um, how do I want to frame this? The uh, the possibility of giving an account of art from about 1880 to things that are, are in progress and process right now. What history will say about that um, is another thing. You know where my heart lies. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully not too much mudslinging, but <laughs> great. Anybody else? Yeah. That I don't know, but uh, I can take your email and find out. It's, I mean, it's, like I said, even with a big space, they've got so many different rich um, collections. And um, you know, if they get a big gift of something, they may put it on a show. But obviously, they're not going to change a whole wing unless they get an endowment for that as well. So it's, it's I like to call it a high class headache of museums. Um, but it's kind of the nature of the biz. With that said, and I'll talk about MoMA as opposed to the Met, it's not like everything we have in storage is, is of the caliber of, say, the Paley collection. There are some things that I would love to see out or might be some of your favorites or you'd like to see returning. Yeah. Yes. Great question. Thank you for letting me address that. Um, so the show is being put on um, by Jody Houtman in our drawings department and um, by our conservator in paper. We have, we have many, but, but a conservator in our paper, our paper department conser conservation team. Um, Carl, um, Book I'm going to get his name wrong. Um, I'm, it's going to come to me. But um, Carl Burkbeck, I believe is his name. And it's the first time, and even though I'm slipping on his name, that I think we've given credit ever to a conservator as being a co-curator of the show. Um, and uh, they have been working for a couple of years on the show together because so much of it is conservation and because it's so interesting in terms of um, the materials that he's using, their ephemerality. Their this took two years to conserve, um, taking the little pieces off and putting them back on, um, which was a, a darn good excuse for us to be able to do that. The life expectancy, we wish forever. But it's something that our conservators have to sort of work on and um, dedicate themselves to. And um, not all of them are in great condition. What One of the nice things is that when things come in for a show like that, um, and of course it's, it's starting in London, um, a lot of these pieces have to be conserved. 
And so that means money and energy is put into them when it wouldn't necessarily have been otherwise, or not right now. Um, but it's something they have to be very, very careful with, thinking about display. This is not at the London show. It's only going to be um, here in New York. And that was you know, something we, a decision we had to make at MoMA in terms of its very fragility. And, and, um, but it's going to look gorgeous. You mean in terms of, um, so he's asking about exhibition or yeah, loan. A lot of behind the scene meetings. So sometimes curators, and I'm not a curator, I'm an educator, but, um, but we, MoMA's lucky on the one hand um, because our director has very great relationships with lots of institutions and we have a lot of really good stuff. So that means we can borrow really good stuff. In terms of the shows themselves, um, sometimes things are kept kind of secretive, um, but the museums do have to work with one another. You know, you have to tell me when you're working on a show like this, so I don't work on a show like this. Shows can take four years or longer to be put on, and you don't want to find out at the last minute. We like to call it serendipity when, <laughs> when that occurs, <clears throat> but it's not really, um, you know, when shows are too close. Um, so it really depends on the negotiations between the different, uh, the different institutions, what they've already started working on, and then also what their collection holds. So does it make sense for a show to be at the Met? Does it make sense for it to be in Washington? If the National Gallery has big holdings in that area, it makes sense for them to come up with that show, as opposed to if they only have one thing where the Met might have you know, 26 paintings and it might make more sense for it to go there. Or is there enough popularity that maybe they can have it in both and there'll be you know, the venue in Europe and, and the venues here. Um, but there's a lot of negotiation and a lot of probably upset <laughs> and um, a lot of wheeling and dealing that hopefully gets done quickly in the beginning so that there's not too much heartbreak. And then we all enjoy having the shows too. It's, I mean, what a, what a pleasure to have shows on the East Coast even if our institution doesn't, doesn't get it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do they let five-year-olds get memberships? Okay. <laughs> I don't, because I'm not a member. <laughs> I'm a member of the Met. I'm a member of the Met. Since I work at MoMA, I'm not a member. <laughs> yeah. How lovely. How lovely. Well, like I said, I support the Met, and I don't have to, because you know, I can get in free there. But, I, but thank you for, for being our spokesperson.